Now let's talk about how to monitor the behavior of deployed models via their interpretations and explanations. Before we get into the details of how and why we need to do this, let's first try to understand the utility of model interpretations and explanations. Uh, several of the prior works have argued that model understanding can be very critical in various real world applications, particularly those involving high stakes decisions, whether it is healthcare or lending and many more such high stakes applications, right? Uh, to understand how model interpretations and model explanations can be beneficial in these settings and more, let's take some use cases or examples to illustrate their utility. Okay. Um, now, for example, let's say that we are looking at a predictive model, which is potentially buggy, uh, but this model basically takes as input uh, images of animals and then produces predictions about what animal is in the picture. In this case, if we provide the input of uh, input image of a Siberian Husky, you see that the prediction that's coming out of this model is Siberian Husky, right? So far, everything looks good, okay? But upon careful examination of how this model is generating this prediction, for example, seeing what are the pieces of the image that the model is focusing on, uh, we might observe a lot more about what the model is doing or infer a lot more about what the model is doing. For example, in this case, we observe that the model is actually focusing on the snow pieces within the image, indicating that you know it is using snow to determine if the animal in the picture is Siberian Husky or not, right? So this model is indeed a snow detector, but it's not looking really at the features of the animal when making a prediction about which animal it is, right? So since this model is relying on spurious features to make this prediction, it is a clear indication to the developers, engineers, and scientists building this model that they may need to fix the model further so that it is not relying on spurious features and they're not building snow detectors. Okay? Um, in this case, model understanding has facilitated debugging or it has helped facilitate debugging of the model. Now let's think about another scenario where there is a lone applicant uh, and there's a predictive model which takes all the details of the loan applicants and determines if the applicant should get a loan or not. Okay? Loan officer is the decision maker who is at the receiving end of these predictions. Um, now, if this is the setting that we are looking at, uh, so far everything looks reasonable, but if we get more understanding about what are the key features that this model is focusing on, then we can say more about the model, right? So in this case, what we observe is that the model might be focusing more on race and gender when making this uh, decision of denying loan to this applicant. Uh, so this prediction is biased since it is relying on features such as race and gender. And a loan officer who is able to see this uh, can actually decide not to give any kind of weightage to this prediction and rather make his or her own decision about this particular applicant. Right. In this case, model understanding is helping us facilitate bias detection. Okay, So if the model is relying on features such as race or gender. Um, now let's consider another scenario where, again, there is a predictive model which takes as input details of loan applicants and then predicts if the applicant should get a loan or not. Right. In this case, the end user is the loan applicant himself. So the model is telling this person whether he or she will get a loan or not. In this case, the loan has been denied. Right. So just providing that input of your loan has been denied is not very useful to the applicant. But instead, if we provide more understanding as to what the applicant can do, for example, increase your salary by some amount and then pay your credit card bills on time for next three months to get a loan. If we say that to the applicant, then they do have a means for recourse, right? Uh, so that is actually quite helpful to the applicant. And then the applicant has something to work towards or work with uh, in order to go back, fix the, you know, sort of the weaknesses in his profile, and then come back and apply for a loan. 
So in this case, model understanding is helping us provide recourse to individuals who are adversely affected by model predictions. Okay. Now, let's take another scenario where there's a predictive model which takes us input a bunch of patient data um, about patient demographics, about you know, symptoms that patients are facing, prior health conditions, and so on. Uh, and outputs predictions in the form of if a given patient is healthy or sick, right? Now, if we generate a bunch of such predictions and show them to a doctor, the doctor really has no way of knowing how much to rely on each of these predictions or how much not to rely on them. So in this case, if we provide a big picture view of like the patterns that the model is using when making predictions, for example, as you can see on the screen currently, the model is basically uh, using reasonable features such as symptoms such as cold and cough uh, to see if a male patient is sick. But in the case of female patients, the model is relying on ID numbers to determine if a patient is sick or not, right? Uh, so in this case, this understanding that the model is using irrelevant or spurious features on female subpopulation, uh, while it is using relevant features on male population, that understanding will help the doctor determine that this model's predictions should not be trusted on the male, uh, sorry, the female population. Okay. Yeah. And in this case, model understanding has helped the doctor assess if and when to trust model predictions uh, when making decisions. And such an understanding can also be used by authorities, whether it be FDA or any other agencies, uh, to sort of determine if a model is ready to be approved uh, in order to sort of cater to a broader population. So in this case, if the authority sees that the model is basically using spurious features such as ID numbers uh, on female subpopulation, then they may uh, deem that this model is not ready to be deployed at a broad scale because it is relying on uh, spurious features for like half the population basically, right? So in this case, model understanding can help us wet models to determine if they're suitable for deployment in the real world, okay? All right, uh, so clearly model understanding has a lot of utility in terms of enabling debugging, bias detection, recourse determining if and when to trust model predictions and also wet models to assess suitability for deployment. Um, in uh, enabling a lot of such use cases, model understanding is serving several stakeholders uh, who could be end users like loan applicants or decision makers like doctors and loan officers or regulatory agencies such as FDA, European Commission, and of course, researchers, scientists, and engineers in order to debug these kinds of models, right? Um, given that there is so much uh, potential in terms of the use cases that model understanding enables, let's talk a little bit about what are the popular approaches to actually achieve model understanding. So one of the commonly employed strategies is to build models that are inherently predictive. For example, a lot of the model classes, such as whether it be you know, models that are linear models, whether it is logistic regression or linear regression, whether it is shallow decision trees or whether it is rules with uh, you know, fewer predicates and conditions, so these are all models that people can look at and understand the rationale or the logic of the model and are often referred to as inherently interpretable models, right? So such models can not only make predictions, but they're also easy to understand for the different, different kinds of stakeholders and end users, right? So if we think about such models, now if we try and connect it back to the monitoring angle, and say, okay, so we have built such a model. So now, uh, you know, the model is running on sort of like streaming data and there may be a risk that the data has shifted, right? So what do we do? How do we monitor such kind of a model? In order to monitor inherently interpretable models, here are some considerations, okay? So first of all, these models are transparent and interpretable. And these models are, uh, you know, sort of not changing with the data, unless of course we retrain them, right? 
So there is new data coming in and these models are very easy to understand and transparent. And what you see is what you get, right? So nothing new is or out of the box is going to happen in the case of these models. For example, if there is a decision tree, the decision tree will invoke the same set of rules in order to make predictions on any given data point, right? So we have clear understanding of what the model will do irrespective of what the data is. And that's what we are trying to say here. And this basically implies that even if the underlying data changes, the model behavior would remain the same, right? Because we see the model in its entirety, okay? There are no more surprises. So given that we, at least from the sort of model behavior via our understanding of the model's perspective, uh, we don't need to do a lot in terms of model monitoring with models that are inherently interpretable, right? Um, now, another approach that has commonly uh, been employed in the past, you know, half a decade or so in terms of model understanding is applicable to more complex models, uh, whether it is very complex deep neural nets or whether it is black box models that we don't even have access to. In such cases, the way we can understand the model would be to basically explain pre-built models in a post hoc fashion. That is, we may have either a black box model that we have no access to, or we may have an extremely complex deep neural network. So such kinds of models, we can pass them through an explainer algorithm, which explains these models in a post hoc manner, which means uh, it basically generates explanations of these models using simpler models that people can interpret. For example, again, linear models or you know shallow decision trees or like a smaller subset of rules and so on. So we are just breaking down a complex model um, into simpler models that are easy to interpret in, in this kind of an approach, right? Um, so before trying to get to the notion or the point of how can we then use these uh, kinds of post hoc explanations to monitor model behavior, let's first try and understand what are some high level categorizations in terms of post hoc explanations, right? Uh, so these explanations at a very high level can be divided into local explanations and global explanations. Um, local explanations are geared towards explaining individual predictions of models. So you explain a, a single prediction uh, at each time. That's what a local prediction does. And in doing so, they help us unearth biases in the local neighborhood of a given instance. And they help us wet if individual predictions are being made for the right reasons or are relying on relevant features and not spurious or irrelevant ones, right? Global explanations, on the other hand, aim to explain the big picture view or the complete behavior of a given model. And the, in doing so, they actually shed light on these big picture biases, which affect larger subgroups in the data, not just individual points in the data. And in, in doing all of this, they can help us bet if the model at a high level is suitable for deployment, right? So those are two high level categories. So we'll get into the details of some algorithms which are popularly used to generate uh, local explanations as well as global explanations. Now, okay? One of the most commonly used and one of the simpler algorithms to sort of generate local explanations is LINE, uh, which stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations, right? The thing that line does is actually this, is essentially this, right? So let's say our goal is to basically explain the prediction of this point here, which is denoted by a red plus mark, okay? What we do in this algorithm is we first sample points around this point, okay? So we essentially perturb that point slightly and then generate a bunch of samples around that point whose prediction, whose model prediction we would like to explain, okay? Then what we do is we use the model that we want to explain to predict the labels for each of these samples, sampled points that we have generated around X, okay? Or XI, right? Um, so, which basically means we also get the labels for each of these points, which class they belong to according to the labels assigned by the underlying model. 
Now, then what we do is some points within these sampled points are closer to Xi and some are farther away from Xi. So we then weigh these samples according to the distance to Xi and points that are closer to Xi get higher weightage and points that are farther away get lower weightage, okay? Then essentially after doing this, what we do is we learn a simple linear model on these weighted samples. For example, a weighted linear regression or a weighted logistic regression, uh, we fit such a model on these weighted samples and the resulting model is basically a local explanation of the underlying complex model, right? So that is as simple as it gets. So just, just to summarize, what we do is if we were to explain the prediction of this point Xi, you take the point, you perturb it a little bit and generate a bunch of points in the neighborhood of this Xi point. And then we label each of these points using the predictions given by the underlying model. And then we fit a weighted linear model on these points and the model predictions. Uh, and that linear model essentially serves as a local explanation of the underlying complex model, right? So we are essentially doing a local function approximation here. Uh, now, another popular method, which also outputs feature importances, uh, but uses more game theoretic style approaches is called SHAP, but essentially even with SHAP, we get as output feature importances that are local. So again, we get a local explanation uh, from SHAP as well of the underlying complex model. Okay. Uh, some of the other approaches that are commonly used to actually generate these kinds of local explanations, which are feature importances, are gradient-based methods. The idea here is to essentially compute the gradient of the function that we are trying to explain with respect to uh, individual input points, that is each of the features of the individual input points, right? So for example, if we want to understand which features or which parts of this image are influencing the prediction strongly, then what we can do is we can compute the gradient of the underlying complex function that we want to explain with respect to each of the input pixels of this image, right? Um, of course, just computing this vanilla gradient can result in some challenges. For example, the resulting gradients are sometimes noisy and unstable, which means even if we make a small change to the image, the gradients that you compute might vary drastically. So in order to address some of these instability problems, uh, newer approaches such as smooth grad have been proposed where the idea is to smooth the gradient by averaging the gradient across a small neighborhood of points, right? So you can take a point and then perturb the point slightly, generate a few perturbations around the point. Now compute the gradient of the function with respect to each of these points and then compute the average gradient and that will basically serve as an explanation and it addresses the problems of noisiness and unstable or instability of vanilla gradients, right? So these are another set of approaches to compute local explanations. And all of these that we discuss, whether it's LIME or SHAP or gradient-based methods, they all output a vector of feature importances uh, that people can use to sort of understand what features the model is relying on locally. Okay. Now, uh, Given that these are different kinds of post hoc explanations and local post hoc explanations, how can we monitor models using these kinds of explanations, right? Uh, so first of all, hopefully the, the kind of depth of information that these explanations can give us about model behavior convinces all of us in realizing that it is important to continuously monitor local explanations output by the you know, aforementioned feature of attribution-based methods to see if the model uses spurious features to make predictions on any newly encountered data, right? So typically the way people use a lot of these explanation methods is they can help us understand what features is the model relying on. While the model might be relying on uh, appropriate or relevant features for points in the data that it already had seen, 
that may not always be true for newly encountered data, right? So for the prior data that the model has looked at, has been trained, it might be using relevant features, but then when there is a shift that occurs in the data or new kinds of data points that come in, uh, then the model may start looking at irrelevant or fear, uh, spurious features when making predictions about them. So that's exactly what we need to monitor for using local explanations, right? Um, so this is precisely what what where the role that local post hoc explanations can play in terms of monitoring models. So basically, whenever a new point is encountered once the model is deployed, generate local post hoc explanations for the new point as well, and then just check what features is the model relying on for all these newly encountered points and if those are relevant features or if those are spurious features, right? That monitoring needs to be done, okay? Now, the other category of explanations that are also quite popular are global explanations. And I'm going to uh, discuss just like an example of one way of generating our global explanations. By the way, there are also other ways of generating local explanations that we did not entirely get into the details of, uh, but the goal here is to just give an example of how can we think about model monitoring using these explanations. So we are just taking some examples of certain explanations. Okay. Uh, similarly, in case of global explanations, we'll try and see how such generate uh, how such explanations are generated using model distillation. Okay. Um, so let's say here we have a black box model. Okay. So which you know we may not have access to, um, and we have a bunch of data which will be provided or which can be provided as input to this model, and then the model in turn can generate labels for each of these data points. So we have some input data, we have a black box model that is queryable, and it will produce predictions of all any of the data points that we throw at the model, right? Uh, we can actually use this information and pass it through an explanation algorithm, which in turn tries to approximate the behavior of the black box model using a more simpler interpretable model which is optimized to mimic the model predictions on the data we provided as input, right? Uh, so essentially, we'll be able to, or rather the idea behind model distillation is that we take the input instances, we take the model predictions and fit a simpler model, which basically mimics the model predictions on those data points that we provided as input, right? Uh, so, for example, prior work has, you know, used decision tree or rule-based models as these interpretable models. So, you take the input data, you take the model predictions from the black box model, and you essentially fit a decision tree which mimics the predictions of this model, right? So, that is what is referred to as model distillation. Now, given that that's how we generate global post hoc explanations, how can we think about model monitoring via these kinds of explanations? So model distillation approach specifically to generate global explanations often generates explanations that are data dependent, right? Uh, so as we just talked about in the previous slide, the fitted uh, interpretable model like the decision tree essentially is being fit on the input data points and the corresponding model predictions, right? So if the data itself changes, then you would see that this interpretable model that you're fitting as a global post hoc explanation will also change, right? So which means the learned tree or the learned interpretable approximation will change if the underlying data shifts, okay? Now, it is important to continuously generate these global explanations at various time points and monitor them to see how the model is behaving on the data continuously, right? So when the model is built, obviously we'll use the data that the model was built using, and then you know the corresponding model predictions, and then we'll fit a decision tree to approximate the behavior of the underlying model and see some high level patterns about it, right? Now, once more data comes in, we again need to fit this decision tree so that we see now the predictions that are being made by the model on this new kind of data and to make sure that the model is still 
using relevant features and not spurious ones even on this newly encountered data. 